Hello, everybody. Let's start our discussion, um, which is on the big question of uh, European identity, of course, the same topic as uh, about which we have been discussing uh, the last days. Uh, welcome and welcome back. Welcome uh, those of you that are joining us for the first time. Uh, for those of you that didn't have the chance to uh, listen and discuss with our guest, let me briefly introduce them. Uh, our guests are Sophie Duchesne from Paris, Michael Bruter from London, and Hans-Jörg Trenz from Copenhagen, the leading scholars uh, in the international community, and they deal, among other things, of course, with European identity. So um, um, we will start with short statements of our guests on the big issue of uh, European identity or the big question of whether the EU does really need a European identity and uh, we will move on to other questions connected to that. Sophie, would you like to start? Good evening. Thank you very much to the organizers to um, for inviting us here for this uh, Young Scholars Conference this week. It was very nice, and we are very honored to be in this panel and have this discussion about uh, another discussion about European identity. So the difficulty will be that for part of the public of the audience, they already um, uh, could listen to us for a couple of hours. So it, it will be not so easy to not at the same time repeat ourselves and tell you what really we think is important. We will do our best. So this question, uh, does the EU really need um, European identity? I will have a very clear answer. It's really not. And I will try to answer in three times. So uh, what kind of identity are we talking about? Uh, what for? What do we, do, should the EU need uh, an identity? And how could uh, the EU have an identity? I will be very brief. Um, I, I'll be quite strong about this because I believe my Colleagues will more or less say something more nuanced and, and, and maybe the opposite answer. So what kind of, of, of identity are we, are we referring to when uh, with such a question? Although there are uh, very complicated and complex debates in uh, academia in, in, in academic circles about what an identity could be and how we should approach identity and this kind of discussion, uh, clearly when, when you word a question like this is uh, does the EU really need an identity, it means a kind of identity that resembles, that is uh, uh, very uh, similar to an identity for a national state. And this is um, always a bit paradox paradoxical because we keep saying the EU is not supposed to become a super national state. We don't know what the EU is supposed to become, but it's supposed to be something different. Um, it's very clear in all discussions about the EU. We don't want, actually the EU was in a way funded in order to do something different, to be different from national state because, because we wanted to avoid new wars, we wanted to avoid the kind of exclusive, exclusive <laughs> tendency of nationalism, etc. But at the same time, when we have this kind of, of question, it's clearly we want to have a kind of reservoir of diffuse support for the EU. This is why the EU should really need a European identity because it means we will have then some kind of affective relationship between the citizens and the EU and this is exactly what we believe nationalism is. Um, so this is, I think, clearly what the question uh, uh, mentions. Um, why should the EU uh, want or, or need a European identity? So to survive, to avoid collapsing, clearly to continue, to go on, and why do we want the EU to continue? What do we want the EU to, the European integration to go on like this? Uh, we, are, we keep discussing uh, the European crisis, so it's a question of money, but it's also a question of uh, justice, of social inequalities, growing social inequalities. Um, we are now, the sociological work has very clearly documented that there are winners and losers of European integration. And the losers are, are the, the huge majority of European people, actually. So it's, it's more and more obvious in the news, but it's also clear uh, we've known that for a very long time. So why do you want to protect this EU, which is uh, pr actually producing more and more losers, uh, which is actually uh, damaging people's lives in Europe? 
Um, so it's, um, and, and, and moreover, this is what I said, as what is at stake is clearly a kind of exclusive uh, feeling that we want citizens to develop in relationship with the EU. It means that in a way or another, we try to uh, restore with a super power, because Europe is there to be powerful, we want to give this superpower a kind of exclusive uh, attachment of its citizen. Is that really what we want? And the last point would be how could we achieve that anyway? So I've been quite clear in the lecture I gave you yesterday that I, I, I think national identities uh, were actually constructed. That's true, we know that. It's documented, but constructed over a long time. So if we want anyway, a European identity in Europe, we have to wait. We have to see is the new generation, which is uh, <laughs> quite numerous in, in, this, uh, in this room, uh, produces European citizens because we, we, f we, 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 we learn to be national very early as babies, actually. So it means if we want to have European identified citizens, it means we will have to tell them very early in their lives. And so it's a question of generation. Fortunately, no uh, institutions, no government has the authority to impose totally uh, on, us, uh, on citizens an identity. So we can compete, we can construct narratives, we can invent ideas, we can try to give European citizens um, uh, maybe uh, <laughs> that, that they want to become Europeans, but it will take time uh, for them to find their, their part in this story. So, yes, clearly my answer is the EU does not need an identity. We should invent another form of democracy with another kind of attachment of citizens, maybe attachment to other citizens instead uh, as attachment to a, uh, a state. Thank you. Uh, I joined Sophie in thanking the organizers of the conference first of all, since we've got a new audience who should also hear how wonderful a work all of you have done. Uh, I, I had a quick chat over lunch with Sophie and she told me, uh, so the debate tonight, we already know the answer, I'll say no and you'll say yes, she was right. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's part of the game, I guess, as well, to, to sort of debate and disagree. Um, I would say two things. Um, first of all, I would say yes, the EU does need a European identity. It does need its citizens to identify with Europe. And secondly, I think that whether it needs it or not, I would argue is more or less irrelevant because I think that a European identity is here, whether we realize it or not. So that would be the sort of two points I'm going to develop in the next few seconds. Uh, why does it need it? I think that it needs it partly for the reasons why Sophie thinks that it doesn't. Uh, in the sense that I agree that um, politicians are not doing a good job with European integration, but I think that the only way in which this can change is if citizens actually appropriate uh, you, the European Union and the European integration project, so that instead of actually always talking about whether we want more Europe or less Europe, we actually hold the European Union to the same standards uh, to which we would hold our national governments. In other words, if we don't agree with something that the European Union does, we should be able to challenge it without necessarily challenging the principle of European integration. I think that uh, framing the European Union identity as a question, in a way, um, from a policy-making point of view, can be an easy escape for politicians to actually do what they want without being controlled by citizens the way they should be. I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, when we look at the way in which elections have been fought in recent months in Greece, in Italy, uh, the media have been talking about the European question much more than usual in national elections and about whether politicians were actually pro-Europe or anti-Europe. But the problem is that in a way in the discourse, they simply equated Europe with austerity. And I think that in a way, it's not really the emergence of Europe as um, a salient theme in electoral national debates. Instead, it has been the sort of merging, if you want, between the European question and very traditional questions of populism and very traditional questions of economic arbitration, which have been present in elections uh, over and again. So I think that if it were me, I'd rather that citizens believe that the European Union belongs to them as a political system 
and decided what sort of policy they wanted to make, rather than actually think that the European Union is a specific type of policy which it, it, it was never intended uh, to be in the first place. The second thing is that the European Union, I would argue, is definitely by any standard a political system, a fully-fledged political system for the most part. And as a result, if it's a political, uh, political system, it needs to be legitimate. And in modern political history, we only know of two bases of possible legitimacy, which are identity and democracy. And to be very blunt, the European Union is not nearly as democratic as it should be. And therefore, if there is no underlying identity, if there is no will of the people to actually be part of a, a European Union in principle, then we should just stop. I mean, there is really no reason why we should impose a European Union if it's neither democratic nor backed by an underlying identity. And my feeling at this stage is that despite all the ambient pessimism, is that there is an underlying level of European identity, which means that in a way, when you actually try to measure citizens' identification with the European Union, you actually end up tapping into a number of things which, as I mentioned earlier, citizens actually increasingly take for granted. And in particular, the younger generations, the ones who were actually born uh, after Schengen in some cases, uh, after the beginning of the Euro, there are a number of things within the process of European integration which is just part of the landscape. Uh, I'm feeling old when I say that because I'm one of those people who remember what it was before. And I think that for those of us who do remember what it was before, the progress that has been achieved by European integration, despite all the problems which uh, we'll be able to, uh, to discuss, is something which has actually potentially changed the lives of the people who live in Europe. Now, the reason why I feel that the European Union needs an identity is that I think it also gives some hope to citizens to actually reinvent a different form of democracy. Again, I'm not really trusting our political leaders to do that for us, but I think that there is an option, that there is an alternative, that there is a way of actually trying to reinvent forms of legitimacy, forms of representation, in such a way that the European Union could actually give us an element of civic fulfillment, if you want, of democratic fulfillment, that is no longer expected uh, from the nation states. So my brief introduction, my brief statement is, if there is no European identity, then there is no legitimacy to the European Union project as a political system project. Therefore, the European Union needs it uh, to justify its very existence. Secondly, we want, we need a European identity as idealist uh, citizens because that's the only way in which we would be able to reinvent a democratic system and a representation system which are in crisis, not just at the EU level, but in the developed world in its entirety. And thirdly, the question of whether or not there is, uh, whether or not we need a European identity is partly, well, superfluous if you want, to the extent that I really think that whether we realize it or not, most of the citizens who actually live in Europe as, have one form of European identity, whether critical or not, whether uh, conscious or not, which actually partly shapes uh, our political attitudes and behaviors. Also, my thanks to the organizers, first of all. It's a pleasure to be here in Vienna, in Thuringen. And you have posted quite challenging questions. Do we really need a European identity? And my answer is yes, we do. So sorry, Sophie, you're two one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But on the other hand, we are not voting here. Uh, I have to provide arguments. So there is still a chance that I lose. And um, the arguments I can provide are three. There are three arguments I see why I think that it is unavoidable for Europeans to face the question of a collective identity beyond the national and below the global, which we can call uh, European. And of course, to pose this question with respect to the organizers, do we need a European identity? We can provide either functional arguments in favor of the European identity, this would be the kind of sociological answer, or you can provide normative arguments why we want it. This would be the answer from political theory. And I provide a kind of mix, actually, of arguments. First, 
it is the question, the first argument, uh, why we need a European identity is the question of mediation of diversity and reflection of unity. This is also something I uh, mentioned yesterday in my lecture, that Europe has actually a very long tradition to deflect its underlying diversity and unity. Europe is a continent which has discovered the topic of diversity and unity. And this is not something recently, this has taken place 2,000 years ago. So there is, there are historically grown semantics about precisely this topic, what we discuss now as a European identity. And there's no reason to assume that this reflection, that this particular European reflection is going to finish in the near, in the near future. And there's also no hope that we are going to resolve this question here at this uh, panel. This is simply an ongoing dis discussion that has make that has made Europe, that has invented Europe. Read the nice book by Gerard Delanti on inventing Europe. It is precisely on this uh, uh, topic. So my, uh, my, um, uh, my response here would be that precisely because Europe is diverse, precisely because Europe has discovered the topic of diversity, it needs also to reflect its identity, its unity. And it does this um, uh, constantly. Second argument, why Europe needs a collective identity, this is the unresolved question of democracy. The EU in its present shape has a democratic deficit, but also democracy at nation state level is increasingly perceived as insufficient. Uh, democracy is perceived as insufficient, not only because the EU faces a democratic deficit, but also at a nation state level. This is the kind of normative challenge that we face here in Europe, and we face this normative challenge collectively. This is a collective action problem. We need to coordinate the normative projects of integrating our political communities through self-government. And if Europe approaches such a normative project of democratic self-determination, um, um, it also interacts at a global uh, scale in dealing with these normative questions. It faces the questions of what is the underlying uh, demos, what is the collective, and in doing so, uh, Europe uh, reflects its own identity. So in dealing with these unresolved uh, questions of democratic self-government, it um, unavoidably needs to deal with questions of collective identities. And uh, you mentioned, Sophie, that uh, the EU has, uh, is not becoming a supranational state, has not even the ambition to become a supranational state. But of course, we talk here of uh, forms of democratic self-government that uh, also apply to non-state uh, uh, to, uh, to non-state entities, and in confronting these questions, uh, also non-state entities uh, need to develop uh, collective identities. Third argument uh, in uh, favor of the uh, of the European collective identity is that Europe has evolved as a social space. Uh, Europe is a space uh, where individuals uh, uh, make increasingly uh, shared experiences. They interact, they, in uh, uh, they interchange in this space. Europe is a space of mobility, for instance. It is experienced by the people um, uh, who also um, try to integrate increasingly uh, Europe into their particular life projects. Um, and uh, of course, uh, it is also true, as it was again mentioned by uh, Sophie, that uh, there is increasingly also the experience uh, uh, of winners and losers. Uh, 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 it has been emphasized by crisis. There are growing social divides that uh, mark Europe. Do these social divides prevent the developing of a European identity? I would say no, because the losers, what do they do? They move to the north, they move uh, to where the winners are. Why do they do so? Because they have rights, and these rights are granted by uh, the European Union. So they suddenly discover the relevance of European citizenship. And um, uh, last year, 100,000 uh, of Southern Europeans, of young Southern Europeans, uh, have emigrated uh, to Germany. This is a figure, this is a size that is comparable to the working immigration that took place in the 60s. It is uh, a completely new reality, which is surprisingly uncontroversial. Um, these people in cities like Berlin, these people are even welcomed. Um, so uh, we need uh, to face 
this reality uh, of Europe as a, a social space, uh, which is linked to processes of collective identification of the people uh, who share these experiences. Of course, processes of collective identification are different uh, from a shared collective uh, identity. The other question then is, yeah, uh, the shared collective identity, I just mentioned this, uh, if uh, Europeans need a collective identity, do they also have one? Do they share a collective identity? And here my answer, by the way, is no. They don't have a collective identity, but nobody, no people have collective identities. They do not share a, a, an identity simply because people never have identities. They only talk about identities. This is again what I said yesterday in uh, um, my presentation, that identity is discourse, not culture. So if any one of you in your PhD project has the question what, uh, uh, whether people share a European identity or whether people have a European identity, please abandon it. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a great basis for a further discussion. Before we move on to your questions, because that's the main part, more or less, your questions and the answers of our discussion, let me pose an uh, introductory question for discussion. Um, what do you think are the problems and pitfalls of uh, identity construction or strengthening? If we assume there is collective identity in the, in the EU, what are the problems, pitfalls, dangers, or challenges of, of strengthening? If, if there is no identity, what are the problems and dangers of constructing a collective identity in the EU? I'm not sure I will switch to the new question, but <laughs> as they both said, uh, you know, uh, um, I think, but first I just want to, to reply to, to Michael first. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's paradoxical because you say, um, you, uh, well, you say Europe is not a fully political system. I disagree with that. You can say it's not a fully national state. Okay, but it's a political system. Oh, okay, it is. Okay. And you said there are two le le legitimacy principles, either identity or democracy, which I think is uh, exactly what I, what I feel. I mean, what I feel is that European studies are trying to create a European identity because we are missing democracy. And my point is that what we need is more democracy, not more identity. And if we want, and if we go to the pitfall question, um, if we want to construct an, uh, an another political system, which would be more, well, that we would like more than the, the actual system we've got, then I think we should try with another material and, and another other kind of legitimacy principle. And I think the identity we are interested in is a global identity, is an identity with, with humanity. This is what, what we are aiming at. I think there is a profound ambivalence in, in, in the European integration. One is to go beyond the nation state and the other is to add a new layer of protection against the rest of the world. And I think what we want and I think what, what motivates people who are in favor of, of more Euro European uh, construction is to go toward cosmo in, in the direction of cosmopolitanism and, 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 and a, a global order and not just reorganize the thing at the level of the European continent. It doesn't work, it doesn't work. We have no borders, we don't know. I mean, we keep saying, Yes, to, to other countries, yes, you will join us, but not now, but please wait, but no, we don't want you, but it, it, I mean, it has no meaning. What we want is to try to just have a kind of dynamic because we know that the problem we are, we encounter now are global problems. It's basically the economy and the environment and, 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 and peace and justice. So there is no reason to just, you know, focus only at the European level. So I think there is a, obviously a, a very generous intention in this model. It doesn't work at the moment, and I don't think we can save it just by saying, trying in, in, in any way to, to, to create some kind of collective attachment that would, in a way, uh, just try to, 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 to hide the democratic deficit, which is 
which is in, in all the papers about European identity. And so, sorry for, for, for people who join us now. We had um, um, a couple of days of discussion about, because we have different ways to try to measure. Well, we are social scientists, so we try also to find evidences for what we say. And there is a huge controversy b within European studies at the moment. Is there or is there no European identity? So, as you can see, some people say there is, others say <laughs> there is not, which in a way it's, it's good for you because it means science has no answer. It's really all this discussion is a political discussion and we are here sitting here, but, but I mean, everybody should, should talk because we have no more uh, knowledge in this business that, that you all have. Yeah, I, th I think that, you know, first of all, I, we, Sophia, I, I totally agree with you that the problem of democracy is one that absolutely needs to be sorted by the EU, but where we sort of disagree is on whether uh, identity goes against it or in favor of it, because you're right in saying that in a top-down way. I think that the reason why political leaders want a European identity to emerge is because they think that it will give them a legitimacy instead of democracy, you're absolutely right. But what I think is that by creating that European identity, uh, people are actually putting themselves in the position to actually request the democracy which is missing. Without a European identity, we would not have requests for a European democracy. I think that in a way, uh, I like the fact that a new form of Euroscepticism is emerging nowadays, and I think it's emerging because people are feeling European and because they think, hang on a minute, you know, you keep saying that the European Union is for us and you are not actually putting us in the equation. And I think that the, on, in, you know, I think that in a way, if you want, uh, political leaders from their perspective have created a Frankenstein uh, of European identity because the citizens are finally holding uh, the political project against them. And in a way, uh, when you look at the complaints of a number of Europeans across European countries at the moment, they are surprisingly similar. And they are not similar to the complaints you hear at the moment in, say, the US uh, or in China or in Iran, uh, but they are very profoundly European. So I think that from that point of view, there is something which is you know, quite important. So again, um, I certainly wouldn't want, uh, I think that, again, to me, uh, the legitimacy of a political system is both democracy and identity. I think that you don't necessarily expect, precisely because as you said, it takes time, you don't necessarily expect any political system to be both democratic and based on identity very quickly. But I think you need one to create the other as well. So I guess in a way, um, we sort of disagree mostly on the end result, but not on the fact that democracy is needed. That I can reassure you that I think as well. Now to go back to uh, Irenaeus' question, um, I guess part of the reason why uh, as Sophie mentioned, different scholars reach different conclusions as to whether uh, whether there is a European identity and what it means. It's precisely because we've got different attitudes um, towards the concept of collective identity. Uh, and exactly uh, as we said a second ago, personally, when I hear about collective identities, I feel very happy. Uh, and the reason why is the case is that I simply don't think that um, you know, I feel very French. I have no doubt that Sophie feels very French as well, but I'm sure we mean different things by that. It's perfectly normal. Every citizen comes with his own experience, with his own uh, perspective. Uh, you know, whether you actually come from uh, London or Manchester will give you a different perception of Britishness. Whether you actually come from the majority or from the minority will give you a different perception of Britishness. Whether you are actually, you know, white or black, uh, Church of England or Jewish or Muslim, you will have different conceptions of what it means to you to actually be British. And I think it's exactly the same with the European Union. I think that people have a notion that they feel European but they might mean a number of different things by it. And from that point of view, I think that I wouldn't really see a pitfall in uh, the emergence of a European identity. Again, I think it's all good because to me, identity really means that people want to appropriate a political system. They want to be treated like grown-up citizens. They are holding the politicians to account. They are holding their administrations to account. They are not willing to give a blank check to people just on uh, the grounds that the European Union would supposedly be something which is good per se, and I think that's very good. There would, however, be significant pitfalls in trying to 
impose a definition of what European identity is. In fact, uh, if again I sort of jump uh, back and forth between the European and national identity debates, uh, as you know, I'm very interested in identity questions, not only European, but even other identities as well. Uh, I've always been really interested in understanding what my fellow citizens mean and feel and imply when they say that they feel French. But a few years ago, a government tried to actually organize a debate on what was French identity. And that is something which personally I couldn't accept, just because I think that you don't define identity for citizens. I think that identity is something which is intimate, private, uh, viable, individual. It's something, it's, you know, our part of truth about where we come from and how we actually relate to the people around us. So I think that, you know, the one pitfall I could see is not about the emergence of identity per se, but about the attempt to over-collectivize or over-theorize what a European identity is, or even worse, what it should be. also say something about this relationship between identity and democracy. And on the one hand, it is said that, the question of that if the question of democracy is raised in Europe, then this is an indicator that there must be already some underlying European identity as a basis uh, for raising this question. On the other hand, we expect that uh, an identity is a result democracy. So we have identity both um, as the underlying uh, uh, kind of substrate uh, for democracy and uh, we expect identity to be the result of uh, democracy. This is how uh, this relationship is usually framed in the debate. But I am more interested in practices here, in both uh, democratic practices and identity practices. So I would uh, propose to shift from this kind of categorical discussion to a discussion uh, that, that looks at how um, an identity and democracy are practiced, how people actually exchange uh, uh, a, a meaning and uh, talk about it and, 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 uh, and apply uh, uh, discourses. And um, I would then be interested in a correlation uh, between identity practices and democratic practices in uh, the European uh, framework. And I think a good indicator uh, to see how such practices uh, unfold are if we look at um, how citizens make use of rights. We need some rights that are granted to citizens. We need uh, citizenship. Uh, and uh, a citizenship provides a basis uh, for people, for individuals to enter into particular um, uh, experiences. For instance, to emigrate from Southern Europe uh, to Berlin. So we should uh, look at how a particular citizenship regime unfolds and enables uh, citizens to enter particular practices. And uh, you ask about the dangers, uh, the problems and dangers of constructing collective identities. And I think a danger here is to decouple the debate uh, uh, on collective identity of Europe from uh, the social rights uh, that uh, can facilitate it. That, uh, for instance, European citizenship is too thin. And this might be uh, indeed uh, a reason uh, to be uh, preoccupied that um, um, the European identity is decoupled from rights and uh, from uh, citizenship, that uh, citizens uh, do uh, not perceive the rights that are granted by uh, the EU as uh, sufficient or they do not even see them as uh, uh, relevant. And then the debate uh, on uh, European identity risks to become yeah, almost primordial, I would say, that we look for, um, that, that it tends to become even exclusive or more exclusive than a national identity. I can give you an example of what I mean here. Uh, national identities um, uh, are, of course, intrinsically linked to uh, notions of citizenship, but notions of citizenship um, 
and nowadays has become much more uh, uh, much more inclusive than in a former time of national citizenship. For instance, in France, uh, you can become uh, um, how do you say a French African citizen. This is something that you would be identified as a French, but of African origin. You would never be called a French European. Uh, 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 you would never be called a European African. So Europe here becomes then uh, 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 the kind of marker for exclusion, because French or being French can no longer be used to uh, to exclude the African. They use European and they uh, distinguish then the French European from um, from the French African. So Europe then is a marker uh, of exclusion. And this is certainly one of the risks we have of European um, identity, that it might turn uh, almost primordial to the sense of exclusion. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the... Oh. <laughs> Do you want to say anything? No, no, no. Okay. Let's move on to the questions of the audience. You certainly have many interesting, fascinating questions. Who's the first? Ah. Hi, I'd, I'm Alexandra. From I come from Poland, but I'm at the University of Granada in Spain. So I guess I'm one of these new Europeans, maybe that uh, Sophie referred to. And I have a question. Uh, well. About it was more about what Michael said, but I think it could be to all of you, because you haven't mentioned yet the upcoming Euro Parliament, European Parliament elections, and I was wondering whether or how we could use this opportunity to reinvent this um, representation at at the EU level. And there have been some mm, suggestions like transnational. Party uh, party lists, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, there's not so much time left, but I think that would be a good point to start if we think that it would be a good thing to have a European identity, of course, because <laughs> sometimes maybe some people would not agree. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's get to the questions, maybe. Another one. Hello, my name is Marco, um, and I had a few open points for discussion. Um, I would like to hear from you, um, who do you think the makers of your identity are or should be? Because um, right now I see that um, polit European political leaders are not charismatic. For example, there is no one who is proposing a way out of the crisis, uh, any innovative uh, thoughts. So it seems that they are a bit disconnected from the demos uh, in Europe. And then I, I would also like to ask you uh, what the contents of this identity um, should be? Can they just be uh, economic or a couple of flags in, driving in driver's licenses and uh, um, uh, number plates or should they rather be cultural? For example, should there be a shared European memory? Uh, and then finally, just a point of moving. I think that, um, at least according to my knowledge, I might be wrong, but for, for instance, compared to the US, Europeans don't move. Uh, it's 100,000 people uh, might have moved to Germany last year. Uh, we would have to look at uh, also how permanent this move is. Uh, but we are talking about uh, the population, the combined population of countries that are in a crisis now is about 120 million, if I just think of uh, uh, Italy, Greece, Spain, and Portugal. Um, and there is very high unemployment, like 50% youth unemployment, unemployment in Spain. And most people don't actually move. I come from one of these regions, and I see that Sorry, there can be uh, people, not necessarily um, uh, political leaders, but there are, there are people today, intellectuals, for instance, that uh, say something that have a European resonance. And I want to quote one that died recently. Stefan Hessel, in spite of being over 90, he said uh, things that resonated uh, with the thinking of many young people. 
uh, uh, not only in France, but uh, all over Europe. And one of the things he said is, this is not the Europe we wanted in 1945 when we defeated fascism. It's not this Europe. So perhaps a reflection on European identity, on creating it, uh, if we think it is created, should start from also from uh, these considerations. Thanks. Thank you. Another one? For the first round? My name is Josephine, I'm uh, doing a PhD in Birmingham um, in German studies. Um, I actually have a question about the question of the, <laughs> of the, um, of the, the discussion. Um, does the European Union need a European identity? Which I think is completely like, wrongly phrased, to be honest. It probably was meant to be provocative, but um, well, that's why, why my question uh, arises. Uh, first of all, I was wondering uh, who the EU is. In that context, you know, are we talking about political system? Are we talking about nation states that make up the European Union? Are we talking about, yeah, the system in terms of, you know, confederation or federation or you know, all the other terms, um, supranationalism and all these things that are related to that? Or, yeah, are we talking about um, nation states? Um, then about the uh, European identity, um, which probably should be rather identities. Um, because we're talking here about, um, and I think that was mentioned uh, by one of the discussants already, um, nominal and nominal and virtual identities. You know, what it does it mean to be European um, as, a, as a category? And what does it actually mean for the groups themselves, uh, French Europeans or German Europeans or whatever? And how does that reflect in everyday life, which might be completely different, you know, the way we categorize it and the way it is actually really impressed and expressed and revealed. And then um, thirdly, um, European identity in, in general. I mean, we, if we talk about European identity, the whole concept of enlarging the European Union would not make sense anymore because then we could cross out Article 49. And we would, you know, we, we're talking about Europe at the moment, even though it doesn't signify anything. The only thing that signifies anything is the European Union because we have a very clear picture of what that means and, and who's, you know, um, who are the Europeans. We know that because everyone who has, you know, national citizenship also has EU citizenship. So that's easy to define, whereas with, you know, Europe, that's um, an idea, you know, not, not, not a reality in, in, in that sense, at least compared to the European Union. So um, we would have to understand the EU as one, you know, possible interpretation of the historical idea of, of, of Europe. Um, I really liked um, your, your term in, in your paper um, saying that we're actually talking about um, European identity, you know, the identity that Europeans have, and not so much about a European identity. And I think that how we use these terms is very, very important for how we, we you know, pose questions. And um, there might be, obviously, a, a gap between um, our, how we reflect on these things and then actually the questions we ask um, the people and um, what, you know, for them probably in EU and Europe, Europe is the same, which is understandable because that's how it's being promoted by the European Union. But I think that we should be like more sensitive to those to those things. And um, yeah, what are we actually talking about if we talk about European, EU, Europe and all these things? So I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's a lot of questions. I'll try to actually sort of, you know, take you through a, a quick round the world answer to some of the questions that were asked. Um, I'll start with one uh, which was not as this time, but, but you know, has been sort of in the background as well of this discussion. Um, it's become very fashionable uh, in the past few years, probably in the past four or five years, to say, well, the problem with Europe is that there is no European demos. And uh, that's something which has always fascinated me because I think that, you know, since you were talking about the, the problem of conceptualizing terms, I think that people Typically, the journalists and politicians who talk about that don't question the concept of demos. And I find it really fascinating that typically that sort of questioning of the existence or not of a European demos has been essentially stemming from uh, the British and American literature. And I've got a personal theory about why it's the case, but I'm not sure if it's right or not. Um, obviously, in English, when we talk about the people, this is a plural. And uh, the Greek demos is a singular. And my guess is that when British or American people hear about a demos in the singular, they sort of imagine something which simply doesn't exist, either in Europe or in France or in the UK or in Germany or in anywhere else. I think that the notion that there is a people of Europe to me is pretty obvious because, again, there are a number of uh, fractures, differences, oppositions 
uh, which go across European countries and actually associate a number of people who actually face different problems, have different hopes, uh, and, you know, have different relationships with each other, but not on a national basis. It's not the case that all the Germans want something and all the Italians want something else. It's the case of, you know, a certain category of people in both Germany and Italy facing the same problems, which uh, they partly hold another part of the people both in Germany and in, and in Italy responsible for. So I think that, in a way, the problem with the question of identity is that if we want to sort of talk about European identity, we also need to de-dramatize, de if you want, the concept. I think that to a certain extent, uh, and, uh, and that's partly the way I, I understand your question about, you know, what do we really mean? And, and, you know, is it just a European identity with a sort of ultra big E, or is it really an identity of Europeans? I think that when we think about a European identity, we sometimes fantasize something which is much more collective and generalizable than we would ever expect from either national or regional or local identities. And I think that, you know, partly it's due to the sort of, uh, you know, Gellnerian myths of nationalism, which we sort of implicitly apply or translate at the European level. And I just think that we don't need to, in a way. Um, about uh, the, you know, how to use the European elections to actually sort of entrench um, a European identity. Well, one of the really interesting things is that many people, when they actually try to find evidence for the absence of a European identity, they actually look at uh, the low turnout in European Parliament elections. To me, that's completely wrong, because I think as a political scientist who specializes in elections, even more than I specialize in identity, that turnout in European Parliament elections is just abnormally high, considering the impact it actually has on what happens in our everyday lives. I mean, who, got, who gets a majority in the European Parliament doesn't make a shadow of a difference at the moment. It's starting to, very little by little. But this is very new. I mean, in, for many years, whether there was a right-wing majority in the European Parliament or a left-wing majority in the European Parliament didn't make a difference at all. And what is really interesting is that when there have been some referenda on crucial questions about what Europe should be or where Europe should be going, such as the 2005 referendum in France, then turnout was actually quite high. And not only was turnout high, but many people actually even tried to read the bloody treaty, which is, you know, something that doesn't make any sense. I mean, you know, it, it, it's not understandable for all practical purposes, but people were really interested because they actually want to understand where that is going. And I think that they want to have a say about where it is going as well. So I think that, in a way, the problem with European Parliament elections is that, again, uh, it has been very much a top-down token of democracy. In other words, uh, politicians, the politicians who matter in Europe, who are es essentially the heads of state and government, they are the ones making the decisions, have said, we want to democratize Europe, but we want to democratize it our way. So we are going to create a European parliament, which is going to be the weaker of the two chambers of the European legislature, and you are going to vote for it. You're not going to vote for the people who actually matter in making the decisions. You're not going to have any say in who is actually controlling the agenda of European integration, which is the Commission. Instead, you are going to, co you know, to vote on the Parliament, which, with the greatest of respect for the European Parliament, which I think is a great institution, uh, has not been given the powers that a lower chamber in a regular federal system would normally be expected to have. So I think that if we want to use uh, European Parliament elections to actually entrench European democracy, the first thing we need to do is to actually make the European Parliament really matter. And by that I mean not just increase the place of the European Parliament within the EU decision-making system, but actually increase the impact of who gets a majority in the European Parliament on the policies that are made by the European Union. At this stage, it is the case that the policies made by the European Union are simply not uh, dependent, if you want, upon who gets a majority in the European Parliament, and this is simply not acceptable. That's not the way we should actually want to build a European uh, democratic system. There might be some level of consensus in the way we decide on policy in the European Union, but in some way, we want it to matter nonetheless. Um, the other thing is that what the European Union is pretty bad at, strangely enough, and I say strangely enough because it thinks it's very good at it, 
uh, the European Union is not very good at symbols. And I think that another way in which they could actually use European Parliament elections is in trying to actually be, use them to become a symbol of doing democracy differently. What if the European Parliament uh, elections were open, for instance, to all young Europeans aged 16 and over as opposed to 18 and over? What if, you know, we managed to convince the heads of states and government that because there is a very futuristic intention, if you want, in the process of European integration, uh, maybe citizens who actually live in the European Union but do not have uh, the citizenship of one of the EU member states were represented somehow in the European Union policymaking process as well. So that's the sort of thing which could be discussed, could be questioned. And I think that if the European Union could become a champion of democracy in some ways, uh, while it is, uh, you know, the bad, the bad student of democracy in so many other ways, then maybe it would actually manage to, to do a number of things. Um, I'm going to, to accelerate because I'm very conscious that the others need to answer as well. Um, politicians disconnected from the demos, I completely agree. Um, I think that, again, in many ways, to me, the solution to that is the emergence of a European democracy because it's, again, a question of citizens appropriating the political system, deciding that it's theirs and therefore they need to have a say. Um, the fact that people don't move, um, I don't actually agree with you on that. I think that an increasing proportion of people move and I think you're right to say, well, is it permanent or not? But in a way, we don't necessarily want it to be permanent because permanent is migration, while uh, temporary or flexible is citizenship. And the great thing about EU citizenship is that for the first time, we don't need to actually decide in advance when we actually decide to move to another Euro uh, European member state, whether we are going on a holiday or being a migrant who is going to live there forever. And I think that this is what makes European integration and European citizenship so particular. The fact that in a way it's still your territory, so you don't need to decide in advance whether it's permanent or not. But when you think about the number of say Polish people or Latvian people uh, or Hungarian people who have actually moved to the UK and Ireland in recent years, when you think about the way in which countries like Malta, for instance, or Italy, which never used to be countries of immigration, um, of immigration, sorry, have become countries of immigration and not only of immigration in recent years, uh, then it tells you something about what the European Union is actually doing to manage some form of um, mixing, if you want, uh, of very different Europeans. And I also don't really, I completely understand your point about the risk of conglomeration, but I don't actually see it uh, in the sense that, you know, for every uh, people who actually move to the UK because they actually think that, you know, they want to work in the city or whatever. Um, you have some British people who will actually move to Greece and Italy uh, because they actually think that they are going to be happier there. And I think that progressively um, the evolution of intra-European, intra-EU migrations is going to be more and more balanced and more and more regular because people will realize uh, that there is no risk in actually going somewhere else because you can always come back. Um, and uh, reflections of identity on daily life completely agree. Uh, the Hessel reference, I don't really agree, uh, but, uh, and the question of, you know, what European identity we mean, and exactly, uh, I completely agree with uh, the question of the concept, but I would say there uh, a word of, you know, sort of relativism, if you want. Um, you're right that Europe is not clearly defined, but I guess that from an identity point of view, neither is Germany and nor is France. Uh, in the sense that you could be able to actually point out to Germany on a map very clearly, or France on a map very clearly, but this is not the Germany or the France which matters when it comes to French identity or German identity. The, the Germany and France that matter in the same way um, that we can describe the Europe that matters is the one which is fantasized by people. And I think that this one is, I know I'm, it's terribly constructivist, I'm afraid, uh, but I think that you know, in many ways, um, in that sense, I, I think that a certain element of vagueness about what Europe really is, is something which actually tells us about European identity more than it prevents us from understanding it, I would say. Well, Michael provided the most comprehensive answer possible. <laughs> and I also actually fully agree with basically everything you have said. So I will be very selective uh, in just picking up uh, some of the points that were uh, raised by you. Um, the makers of European identity, that was uh, one of the questions. Uh, we are used to look at 
series that the makers of the European identity at the intellectuals, uh, maybe. And probably this is uh, also true, that indeed uh, European identity is promoted as an elite uh, project. And uh, that these elites, these makers, are disconnected from the demos. But then the question is, again, what, uh, what's the demos? You, I fully agree with your critical remarks on this. My favorite quote here is uh, Niklas Luhmann, uh, who said, uh, if there were no demos, who would ever motivate them? And uh, this is probably absolutely true. And this uh, relates to the core of what democracy is. Democracy does not need the demos. It sounds strange, but this is the case. Democracy uh, needs people who talk about the demos and then at some point uh, may imagine to be one. But that's all. And um, mobility. Um, yes, uh, I agree here with uh, uh, Michael that uh, Europeans move increasingly and uh, temporary migration is actually a very interesting uh, pattern that you can integrate uh, Europe um, as part of your life experience for some years, for a decade or whatsoever. And you can return to this maybe when you are in uh, pension and decide to move again to, uh, to Spain or to another European country. And um, on the other hand, of course, I also agree with your point that uh, mobility, uh, if uh, it is used, it is mainly used by the privileged, by the more uh, privileged, that the most vulnerable, they stay, they don't uh, move. And this is, in the, this is indeed a problem, the EU citizenship, uh, this also relates to what I said before, that the rights uh, that are granted to European citizens are not perceived as relevant enough. These rights are made for the mobile elites, and indeed the mobile elites are those who uh, mostly uh, make use of it. Even if uh, you are, um, if you are unemployed and affected by crisis, still those who move are those with the high education and with the university degree. Those who do not have this possibility, they stay. So the most vulnerable, they stay. But then the interesting question is how do these underprivileged groups react to this situation of being increasingly excluded? The fact that European citizenship uh, gives, uh, gives rise to a new class divide. If this is the case, the interesting question is what kind of resistances does this produce? Does this end up in a new class conflict? And then I would even argue that these kind of new class conflicts can become uh, part of the dynamic of um, developing uh, European identity. First, turning to the question, what should we do uh, using the European election to try to reactivate something about European integration? I think what you should do is to get involved in national politics. I think what is happening and what is really, I think, at the base of the crisis of Europe is, uh, and I, I, I said it and I, I will say it again, is a growing distrust between people and politics, between people and politicians, and the politicians we know are at the national level. There are no charismatic people at the European level, but are there many at the national level at the moment? And this is a problem. You cannot invite, uh, you cannot in invent, sorry. <laughs> well, we should invite charismatic people from abroad, <laughs> that for sure. <laughs> but we, we cannot in invent politicians at a level where we, 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 for the moment, which is too, too far away. So we have to re-involve in national politics. We have to involve into, into national parties. And parties have a, a, a terrific, uh, I mean, nobody, everybody hate parties. But one of the reasons why there is no democracy at the European level is because we have no European parties. And in order to create European parties, we have to get involved into national parties and get them to, you know, have real networks and integrate at the European level. So I know this is not what you want to do. You would like to escape the kind of failure of national democracy and dream of some kind of European democracy. But it's a dream. I mean, I don't live on the same continent as Michael. 
I don't see anything of what it is, except that I am a winner of European integration. I am here because the European Commission paid for us, <laughs> not, not, not completely, but partly. <laughs> I'm, I'm part of this, of this mobile European, of these people with a lot of resources, but, but it's only for us. It's not for, for most of the people. So what we have to do is reinvent politics. It's, uh, well, stay, uh, and I think maybe, well, I'm a social scientist and I don't want to change that now. I'm too old now, but maybe you should think very carefully before uh, going into academia. Uh, I think you should better, if you are really interested into European issues, go and, and, and do politics. I think this is what, what, what you should do. Um, uh, and this is not because you do quantitative work, although <laughs> maybe also. <laughs> Um, so I think this is what is important. But as social scientists, we also have uh, we also have some kind of it's it's something to do with this charismatic um, function in a democracy. In France, it used to be intellectual, and 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 there used to be people doing philosophy and social sciences. I mean, the the, the last charismatic people we had were coming from sociology. And I think it's part of the failure of what we've done is social sciences have become more and more involved into the legitimation of what exists in, instead of being here to, you know, to criticize, to show what, what doesn't work, to give new ideas, to try to give incentive to change what, 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 what is there and not push forward what is already exists. So I think, yes, we, we, we should do that as well. So mobility, there are more and more... Um, research project going on on mobility of European people because seeing that European identity was not arriving so quickly, um, there is a new trend of research now saying, well, okay, if this does not happen in the heads and the art, uh, hearts of Europeans, then it will come from their practices and habits. So let's see what they do. And they will become European because they will use their rights in a way they will become um, you know, have mobility and become uh, mobile people. And, and, and yes, it doesn't work. I mean, all results are very disappointing in, for people who want to see that people are becoming European. So it, and, and it's even amazing, even among winners, even among high educated people, ev even among executives, the degrees, the amount of mobility is much smaller than expected. Even if it's easy, it's possible, if you don't have to change your currency, if it's, it's easy now to, so again, I really think that nations are still here. And, and if you want to change something, you have to get involved where, where it happens within the nation. Um, regarding EU, Europe, I think part of the discussion of, of the difficulty to find a good word, uh, uh, appropriate, appropriated word, word, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, it's also uh, related to this difficult relationship between the, the political and the cultural at the European level. I mean, we all agree if, if there is something like a European identity, collective identity, in the sense that we have a common history. We, we fought against each other, and this is what makes history. If, if Fran France is supposed to have such a strong identity, it's because we had lots of wars and, 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 and we and we, we celebrated that, and, <laughs> and in a way, and France was born from that. And this is the same with Europe. So we have this culture in the sense of a shared long-term um, uh, shared uh, history and, and memory in a way. But it's very different from having a political identity. So the difference between EU and Europe is really there. And as long as we will not have solved this, it, it's more, more than, it's not because we would just use pro appro appropriated term it will not change the reality. We will find the term once we have actually built some kind of European democracy. And just a very uh, last few, uh, last word on, on what you said, uh, Antioch, on, on French African and French European, I think it's really, really true. So Europe is supposed to be the paradise of diversity, to have invented diversity, but what is happening at the moment is in each nation, we are less and less tolerant and, and open to, to the real diversity with which migration from everywhere it comes. So, uh, and, and it's true that in France, uh, what is actually happening is that people are more and more racist and xenophobia is growing and, and, and so this is also a concern. So distrust toward, uh, against politicians and racism growing up in, in all European countries, 
I think these are real problems that we should address before trying to invent some kind of European identity. Thank you very much. Who's up for the second round? Over here. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up, follow up on the point uh, of the democratic deficit um, because my question, or maybe it's more like a comment, is um, I think that we probably overest we are o overestimating the problem of the democratic deficit because actually every or almost every decision uh, of the EU is legitimized by the, by the national governments. And we still agree that national states um, are uh, important in, in the game. And um, ev every treaty was legitimized by the governments. And governments are legitimized in a democratic way. So um, if we agree that the European identity, European demos, is still a problematic issue, maybe we uh, overestimate the, the problem of, of democratic deficit. Maybe it's Maybe it's the maximum that we, that, that we can achieve uh, right now. Maybe it's the problem is rather the political program, how to how to how, how to how to uh, construct the ag agenda for for the EU, and not the the question of demos or democratic deficit, because I think that that as we have 27 democracies uh, within the EU, we cannot say that the EU is totally undemocratic. Uh, good evening, my name is uh, Fabian Haun, I'm a master candidate here in uh, Jena and uh, yeah, my master thesis is uh, dealing about uh, political participation of uh, young people in the EU, especially on, uh, in EU politics and that's why it's uh, great for me that especially you, uh, Mr. Brute and Hans-Jörg Trenz are here because um, um, yeah, I got a little familiar with your works during uh, the last year and that's why I would like to ask uh, uh, this question because I could not find it out in, uh, in your work so far. Um, a little bit more the focus from on European identity um, from, the, from the starting point of uh, political participation. Um, you said um, before that um, uh, European identity is an outcome of uh, democracy when people are using their citizen rights, uh, as I understood, understood you right, uh, when they're participating. So, but I'm, as far as I um, got through the, the research, isn't it also that, is it that um, European identity is a necessity for democracy? Um, if you if you think the other way around that uh, people need to feel affected to feel to belong to this uh, political system the EU and then they first become active and uh, um, feel concerned about the outcomes about the policies and then they start to participate um, that's my question thank you My name is Thorsten Oppenheim. I teach political science here in Jena. Um, I have two remarks more than maybe you would like to comment on. The first, the European demos. Now that's been settled. Uh, authorities like Habermas and Derrida uh, published an article in uh, many European papers uh, 10 years ago um, and they decreed that there is a demos and that there is a European public um, and actually they, um, the um, um, event that triggered it was the Iraq war that began 10 years ago today and the protests in, uh, against the, the Iraq war in many European ca uh, capitals, that was their... Um, um, signature that the sign that there was a European public and a European demos. Uh, second remark, um, I looked at uh, party websites because I'm interested in, in, in party identity um, and um, I compared websites, the, the historical um, image of parties that draw of themselves, of their own history 
And um, with one notable exception, which is Ireland, uh, with a small Irish Labour Party, no social democratic party, at least of those whose language I understand, um, made any reference at all to Europe. Completely an uh, image of national actor exclusively on the national le level. Uh, so when you, you talked about uh, uh, to get engaged in, in national party politics, that's all there is where you can engage this day. So maybe you'd like to ex co comment on why that is so. Okay, this is the kind of question that I think will mark and embarrass me for life, but I was, and I should probably leave it for later. But I was thinking about when you were speaking, and it seems to me that the main disagreement that arises, in particular between Professor Bruter and Sophie, is in, in different understanding of uh, identity, and that what you are basically saying, both of you are saying in a way against yourself, and that the answer to your dilemma lies in what Professor Trent was saying. And when Michael Brutter was speaking about European identity, you on the one side claim that the reason that we need European identity is that we need European democracy because we need some sort of legitimation for a European polity. And the only way that this can arise is from identity. But I think the identity that you are measuring is not the one that is going to bring up a European polity because you, what you are measuring, and I think you do it wonderfully and very successfully, is a very private, almost unconscious uh, sense of uh, belonging to somewhere. But out of a sense of belonging to somewhere, the feeling of necessity to involve politically does not necessarily arise. You need something more. On the other hand, uh, when Sophie was saying that she doesn't believe that we need um, European identity, uh, and then you were speaking that we need more pol uh, politics, and that what is really missing at the European level is politics. I think for a certain kind of political engagement, you do need a certain type of very, very secular identity, which I think Michael Bruter is missing. And I think Professor Trent, when he was speaking about European citizenship, has the answer to this. Because what you really would want is not this type of um, cultural identity that I believe you are in a way afraid of, because you said we don't want Europe to resemble a nation in this sense. But what we do want is a, is a place of political activity. In order for this to happen, it seems to me that the only reasonable way is to somehow work on European citizenship as a very secular identity. However, I see two problems with Professor Trent's solution. I fully agree that discourses are tremendously important, and I tend to consider myself somebody who wants to work on, on uh, analyze, analysis of European discourses. But the problem is that no matter how much you uh, analyze discourses and come up with um, very interesting narratives that exist on Europe, uh, ultimately these are not going to be something that's going to move Europe. And the reason for that is what all of you have been speaking, which is that we can't construct identities, nor can we impose the existence of identities that by convincing anybody that it already exists, we just don't see it. I don't know if I'm making any sense here. So ultimately, I don't have a, a solution for this. I just wanted to point out that maybe the differences between you are not so big. It's just that all of you are maybe, when speaking of identity, speaking of different levels, and the one that you're really aiming at is out of reach of what you are going against. Sorry for the, the long talk. <laughs> with this democratic deficit of the European Union that it was claimed that this is uh, maybe overstated or overestimated the, rel the relevance of this. There I do not agree. I do not agree <laughs> because um, a democratic deficit is not established in formal terms. And your response uh, or your argument was a formal one to say that the uh, that EU legitimacy is granted because national governments are the masters of the treaties. And as long as they remain the masters of the treaties, uh, there is no real uh, democratic deficit because the governments are legitimized in a democratic uh, way. This is not even true in formal terms because the EU legitimacy uh, has uh, 
two uh, sources, uh, so to speak, if it is a part of the treaty. Um, it is the, um, um, the EU is legitimated by the governments and it is legitimated uh, by the people. Because we also have the European parliamentary elections and we have different forms of citizen participation and uh, citizen involvement in EU uh, decision making. So there I uh, definitely do uh, not agree and the democratic deficit is of course uh, 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 linked to particular concerns uh, of citizens that are growing over time, that are given articulation and in particular now uh, in terms of crisis if uh, we look at, for instance, how the stability uh, pact has been uh, negotiated among uh, uh, the governments, even outside the official EU uh, framework, we definitely have lots of reason uh, to be concerned. And this is also given expression by uh, the citizens. Um, mm, the question by, I can't remember exactly where it was. I think it was by you, actually, yes. Identity as an uh, outcome through participation, but identity uh, also as a necessity uh, for democracy. Who was it? It was you, yes, okay. I, I, I remember right. I think I mentioned this uh, before that uh, you have this kind of paradoxical situation which ends up in a hand and egg uh, question. What has uh, been first there? The uh, demos and the identity or uh, democracy and democratic practice that leads uh, to a demos and identity. And my uh, favorite answer here, before it was Luhmann, now it is uh, John Dewey. Uh, it is pragmatism that uh, it is through the identification of shared uh, problems uh, that uh, people start to reflect. Uh, uh, they start to become engaged in uh, discourse. They discover to be a public. So publics are uh, kind of constituted uh, through the identification of uh, shared problems. This is the kind of pragmatic answer I can uh, give uh, to this. And by the way, this again resolves uh, this again would uh, link also to Luhmann, because also Luhmann gave this answer, how to resolve paradoxes, because we have to be here to the paradox. And his answer was, we enter practice. And um, the last question, uh, I, so again, I picked here uh, some of the questions. The last question was related to uh, collective uh, identities that uh, need to link to um, some form of public engagement and uh, the European citizenship could become uh, the catalyst uh, for this. And then the problem was, um, yeah, uh, discourse. Um, that uh, these discourses uh, do not, uh, how do they convince uh, the citizens? Uh, uh, how can they have any um, uh, how can they have any effects uh, the discourses do not really move europe they do not really have how can they show that they have any uh, impact but again i think that this is not exactly the kind of question we should pose here uh, we should not um, uh, try to build causal relationships between the promoters of particular discourses and uh, particular outcomes. I don't think that this is the kind of research agenda we uh, should uh, uh, follow here. If you allow me to link this again to the question of EU citizenship, EU citizenship is of course not only linked to uh, discourses, it is also linked to particular practices. So what, uh, uh, what, uh, so what we are interested here is how citizenship rights, formal rights, are translated by the citizens into uh, practices. What is called in a nice book by Antje Wiener, a European citizenship uh, practice. And this is a very similar uh, agenda that I would propose to uh, follow here. Thank you. Robert, 
the democratic deficit and the fact that uh, legitimation is uh, still based at the national level. First, I agree with Andiog, um, there is a question and, and, and this is a concern, although I feel since it's to turn out this pretty good, I think most promoters of the European Union would like to see more participation at the European elections, so there is this problem. And here, identity comes first. So what, what makes people uh, voting is the fact that they identify with a people, or in this case, uh, uh, some people, <laughs> a few people, several people. Um, but regarding national level, I come back to what I said before. The problem is if you have a democratic deficit at the, at the national level, and I think it's more and more the case in most European countries, then you are in trouble. Moreover, what happens, I think, in many European countries, it's the, it's the case in France for sure, is that our national governments actually lie to us regarding the European issues. What happened with lie to us or, 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 or trick? I mean, what, what happened with the referendum in France is we actually re rejected the constitution and six months later we had exactly the same treaty except that we, we didn't revote. We, you can have Irish people voting again, but not us. So what happened is that the parliament actually adopted exactly the treaty we, we, we rejected. So. And it was supposed to be a, an important process of national legitimation, this constitution, involving people at the national level and, and, and really legitimize it. So, so yes, what, what, should be, what should happen is that the national level should be still now, I mean, national uh, countries in Europe should be building together the, uh, the, the European um, Union, but it's not what happened. They are actually playing all the time against each other and, and they only give us, I mean, the, the, the bad news from Europe. And when something is good, we don't know. We, we, I mean, we are not told, we're only told about what the, 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 the bad outcomes. Um, this question about identity and participation, also the question wasn't exactly from me, but I took it too. Um, I think what makes people participate is not a territorial identity is not this kind of identification with a country. This is a political socialization gives you identification with ideologies, with class, with groups of people, but usually what makes people participate in elections is a kind of national identification or territorial identification or local or European. But Regarding active participation in the political system, in parties, in movements, and especially for, for young people, it's usually another kind of identification, which is to feeling that you belong to the left, or feeling that you belong to, again, a, a working class, or feeling that you belong to, I don't know, for feminists, to, 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 to women. Or this is this kind of partial identification that gives you the, the, in, the, the, the moves, the, the Sorry, I'm missing the word. So, you participate. <laughs> so, it, it's true that there is this, this relationship between identification and, and participation, but it's, it's different. While it's the relationship between, again, national identity and participation and national election is, is, very, is, uh, is, is very strong. And then it's a problem of history. I'm not an historian, but we know that democratic, part, uh, that, that mass democracy more or less happened at the same time that nations were invented. And we know that there is a close link between this kind of mobilization given by the feeling to belong to a nation and, the fact and, 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 and people learned more or less to, to take part to elections, which was not so, I mean, it was a very powerful invention and people had to learn to do that. And, and, and historically it happened more or less at the same time. But people were very different from what they are nowadays. I mean, the level of education, it's completely different. So if we had to go in, uh, to invent a new system, obviously the mechanism will be different. And we cannot reinvent the same kind of, of yes, induction or, or learning process to, to, to a wider uh, Europe, to a wider political system. I'm not sure I'm very clear. But However, what I, I go back to what is important is the question of mobilization. Take 
getting engaged in politics is not something natural. People are not naturally political beings. You have to be taught to that. You have to learn it, to have you get mobilized by institution. And I go back to the role of political parties in our society. The main failure is that. Because what, what again, helped mass democracy to, to, to work was working class parties. They got people who had not the resources to get, let's say not naturally because it's a social, it's a, it's a, it's a social process, but had the resources to fight for their own interest. But people who had to be taught about their own interest. It, this was done by political parties, by mass political parties. So this is where part of the problem of our democracies is, I think. But again, and then about the question of why uh, would um, uh, Social Democratic Party not mention Europe. I think we have two illusions at the moment in, in, um, about this, what happened with European publics is one is European identity, I still, but we have a problem with words, but I still don't think we, no such things exist. But this is the same with Euroscepticism. Euroscepticism exists among elites, it exists among parties, but it doesn't exist in the public, but parties fear it. They are terrified about mentioning Europe because they, they, they tend to, politicians believe that part of the success of extreme right parties and extreme left parties is Euroscepticism, which I personally, but I have no proof, no evidence, I don't think it's true. You have xenophobia on one side and on the other side you have the evolution of the European system. But I think uh, what, what we feel is that wh what we, at least for the French youth, and I'm almost sure, politicians don't want to refer to Europe, they don't want to mention it, and then we go back to the first question, which is we don't have this legitimation process which should, which should come from, from national state, and then we are into trouble. Sorry. Um, I mean, um, uh, I don't have that much to add, actually. Uh, that's good news for you, I think, uh, <laughs> because I, I very much agree with what has been said by my two colleagues already. So just a, a few sort of, you know, extra pointers. Um, the first one is um, that there is a sort of missing concept in the discussion we've had tonight, which is the concept which uh, we actually tend to hear most about in many conferences about European identity, which is the notion of a European public sphere. Um, and you know we haven't really talked about it, but I think it has been in the background the whole time as well because um, I fully agree with uh, Antioch's point about you know citizenship in practice because I really think that not not because not in a normative way, it, although normatively I think it's good, but you know that that's not really relevant. But just because I think this is what is really meaningful to people, I think that they can relate to the practice, they can relate to the rights and duties which they associate about citizenship. And I think that this is a foundation of who we think we are as political beings. But there is this other element, which uh, in a way is also in the background of that uh, question of the demos, which is we do discuss very much the same issues all over Europe. And people might or might not realize it in a way, you know, it doesn't really matter. But it, we do tend to discuss the same issues at more or less the same time, including the fact that politicians lie to us, including the fact that we don't trust banks, including the fact that you know, there is this growing gap uh, between the rich and the poor, including the fact that xenophobia and racism uh, are increasing. So you know, we, we do face, in many ways, the same problems in ways which are much more synchronized than they used to be a few decades ago, whether we want it or not. And I think, you know, and when you read the work of people like Ritze or Kantner, they say, you know, in their studies, who are more specialists than I am, or uh, Clark de Vres, they will say, uh, well, there is an emerging European public sphere. Clearly, there is a commonality, including in the way we talk about each other's elections and including the way we talk, for instance, across Europe about the, the French referendum. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to mention. The second one was, you know, the, the answer to your question uh, about uh, whether people need to feel affected uh, to participate rather than the other way around. I think that's absolutely right, but I think people feel affected by the European Union, whether they like it or not. Uh, both the people who like Europe and the people who don't, I think that in many ways they sort of overestimate in many ways the way they are being affected by Europe and the European Union. Because precisely as uh, Sophie told us, we do get some incomplete information about what Europe does and what Europe stands for. 
uh, filtered by the national media. Think about what happened in Cyprus the other day. I mean, you know, fascinating stuff. Uh, we hear that, well, in depressing stuff as well, uh, but fascinating nonetheless. Uh, we hear that the European Union is trying to uh, seize uh, money from everybody's bank account in Cyprus. And then a couple of days later, we hear that actually the European proposal was that all accounts under a certain a fairly high amount of money should be exempt. And that it's the Cyprus government which refused it because they didn't want to actually threaten uh, the very wealthy people who actually deposit a lot of money in their accounts uh, for a variety of moral or possibly moral reasons. So, you know, we do get this, uh, my former PhD supervisor, Mark Franklin, used to refer to it as the Uncle Dutch and Aunt Sally syndrome. Uh, you know, every time that um, the, you know, uncle and aunt out are bringing you a present, it's Uncle Dutch bringing you a present, and every time they say something mean, it's Aunt Sally. Uh, you know, the European governments are very good at playing that. You know, every time they actually want to pass something which is unpopular, but they don't want to say that it's their decision. They say, oh, well, you know, we really couldn't do anything. It's Europe. And every time Europe does something good, look at what I brought back from Brussels. You know, I fought for our interests. So, you know, they are the ones who actually control the agenda. They are the ones who actually control communication. And that has a result on the channeling of legitimacy. Um, so I think people do feel that they're affected, sometimes rightly, sometimes strongly. But I think that what they need to, to perceive is that they're affected by the result of the election. And again, that's very different. But that we know from political science. We know that the two classic determinants of turnout are the perceived stakes of the election and the perceived closeness of the race. When you think of European Parliament election, I mean, that's you know, sort of universally found uh, by all the people who've worked on that. Perceived closeness of the race in European Parliament election is never close because we already know in advance, I can already tell you today, that the British and French government parties are going to get a bulletin uh, in June 2014. We know that in advance. That's the point of European election. And perceived stakes, they are minimal because, again, who cares whether there are more left-wing or right-wing MEPs in Strasbourg, Brussels, wherever you want to, uh, to place the main seat of the European Parliament, I guess. Um, you know, it doesn't really impact on the way the European Union is governed. People, again, when you give them a chance to have a say on how the EU should be stirred, then they are interested. But the European Parliament elections, that doesn't actually have an impact on what uh, Europe is being built. Um, and then the last thing about uh, the question of whether we took, uh, Tamara's question about whether we took about different notions of identity, uh, yes, we definitely do. Um, and then more specifically, uh, the one I took about, which is largely subconscious, yes, that's right. Does it mean that it can't be mobilized? I don't know. Um, let's talk about love for a minute, right? Uh, relationships. Uh, you can be sure that whenever somebody in a couple says, you know, if you want us to stay together, you need to change this. If you change this, then the couple is going to collapse anyway. Because the way people express their concerns about what's happening uh, around them in their lives is never the way they are really hurt by things or they are really affected by things. And in many ways, as a result, I think that the subconscious layer has the power to actually mobilize people and make them do things in a way that the things they say don't. You know, the, the sort of uh, saying about the dogs who bark who are not the ones who bite, you know, that, that's a bit the same. Uh, words are great, words are important, expression is important, but deeply, I believe that the subconscious layer of identity, not just at the European level, but in everything we do, um, do affect our be behavior on an everyday basis. Now, the problem is that subconscious identity, on the other hand, as, and, and again, you've understood by now, after listening to uh, far too much of me for the past 24 hours, that I'm very much taking a sort of bottom-up um, perception of identity. The problem with a bottom-up subconscious identity is that it's not easily readable, on the other hand, by the top, by the people who govern us. And as a result, you only stumble on the type of queries, the type of political conflicts or contests or questions which can make people react by chance. Because in a way, the citizens are not very good at actually telling people who govern them what they actually want to hear and what they actually want to find. And the people who govern us don't really want to hear it anyway. So, you know, when you put the two together, I think that the limit 
um, of my conception of identity is not so much that subconscious doesn't matter, but that subconscious doesn't communicate if you want. Thank you very much. Five minutes left. One or two questions. There was one, I think. Three. Three short questions. Um, thank you very much uh, for your time and comments. And um, I was just wondering how you define democracy, really, because um, as we look at the European scale right now, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, just if we look at the national level, democracy is changing. If you look at young people and how they in, um, act, uh, act politically, it's changing. Look at the London protests last year. Look at the protests across Europe now. Um, isn't it exactly that we see European citizens being politicized and being active and making a change? Cyprus yesterday, you know, um, the Cypriot government had to not accept the Bela terms because of the protests. So in fact, we see that citizens are making a change and making an impact at the EU level. And then whether you think that would affect their European identity if you think it exists and it may be in Sophie's case, European identification. Um, thanks. Um, yes, my question is in a way very simple. Is that uh, do you think that there is in the near future, to take the you know your barometer formulation, do you think that there is any hope for an improvement of democracy in Europe? Because you know I used to be very Europe optimistic, thinking that okay that's slow, but step by step needs time, but when we, s uh, when I watch politics, I don't know, since uh, for 10 years, it just seems to be that um, there is really no European democracy which is emerging and in the last year we just saw that once again they decided that there is no real politics so we impose in a treaty what should be the politics, so that's I'm referring to the rules of uh, no 3% uh, deficit of the GDP. So there is a kind of thinking that there sh um, Europe is improving, but in fact, it's something like getting far, more and more far, or far, and far I don't know, far <laughs> more and more far from a real democracy. And when I saw again in the last day, uh, I think Barroso wrote uh, a letter to the different, I don't know, I think it was for the European Council saying that, yeah, we should go on, on uh, austerity, that it is working, we will see uh, confidence, we will make uh, an employment uh, uh, decrease and, uh, but so like, you know, like the election in Italy, uh, in Italy it doesn't matter the fact that Mario Monti uh, lost. So really it seems that, yeah, step by step we are really losing democracy for a technocracy and is there a kind of any hope <laughs> that's strange? Uh, I mean, is there something which is going the right direction in the European democracy? Mm, hello, I wanted to ask a question about the European citizenship. Mm kind of connected to the European identity and so on. And I want, wanted to ask it from the perspective that um, European citizenship, if we, we look at all the national states or all the states of European Union, it is granted for everyone who is born there. So uh, the whatsoever the youngster or whoever he might be, he doesn't have actually got the choice whether he wants to be a citizenship whether he wants to be participated in the um, political system or um, whatever we could call it in that particular state or uh, what is affecting him. So um, my question would be how, how could you convince the people that the citizenship and you know that the fact that they are um, really like, I would claim that everyone here is um, kind of uh, registered in this in this system, you know, uh, there are data from your uh, governments and so on that uh, where you are, where you have moved, where are you going to moving possibly <laughs> or whatever. So uh, I want to ask this, and I wanted to make some remarks on um, mm, some on the claim of Mr. Trent um, about that 
from the Eastern Europe. There are the people are mostly, <coughs> or mostly of the higher classes are migrating or are mobile in the European Union. Um, well, as far as my friends or what whatsoever the people I know, it's <coughs> very far away from the truth, <laughs> because, because those people that are migrating from the Eastern Europe to the United Kingdom or to Germany or to France. They are mostly those who are <coughs> uh, workers or young people who don't even have an education. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, so very quickly, so I, uh, no way we, we discuss what we mean by democracy now or, or we take another hour, but I, I Yes, I think uh, I think it's related to what Andy uh, said. Um, we we are m maybe experiencing a new a new class uh, um, conflict in there. Well, yeah, uh, maybe I'm, I'm, uh, we've discussed uh, we've discussed we've been discussing um, Flickstein Euro clash uh, along the days, and I think the problem with with the book is only the link with identity. There is a new. Um, clear uh, a class conflict in, in Europe. I don't think we need any identity just to, to see that uh, currently winners and losers might get to conflict just because it's becoming too much. So if I have any hope, um, I have hope when I see so many young people in the room and, and so clearly interested in what is happening in the European Union, I think we, we, we have a fantastic um, education system still now, maybe not for a very long time, because it might be collapsing very quickly with, with, with the fees and, and, and what is happening um, and, 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 and some loss also in freedom of academics. So, so I think your generation will be responsible for uh, what, what the good that can still happen. So I'm, I'm, I'm yes, I believe in you, <laughs> I can say. <laughs> and about citizenship, well, I, I, I totally agree with, with what you said, I think. We, we cannot say Europe is diversity when we have uh, this kind of relationship with migrants uh, within the country. And I don't think that people who uh, migrate and, and, and don't uh, come with their high uh, education level but arrive just because they, 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 they are looking for a job, I don't think they are so well welcome in the different countries where they arrive. Okay, um, well, it, it is indeed very difficult to discuss what we mean by democracy in such a short time, so uh, we might have to sort of postpone, uh, you know, the, the finalization of the answer to that, but I would say still that democracy is about a number of things. It's about people having a say on what is being discussed and what is being decided. It's about being, uh, people having, uh, people being represented. And it's about people being able to get rid of people they don't like uh, when they feel that they have been betrayed by government. And that last point, accountability, I think is what is really missing at the European level. I think that, you know, to answer at the same time, the second question when you ask us, you know, whether we think that there is any hope um, for an improvement of democracy at the European l level, you say, well, we're losing democracy for technocracy. I don't agree. I don't think technocracy is actually that relevant at the European level, Union level. I think that, you know, people will have you believe that the European Commission decides a lot, but it really doesn't. Uh, what we're losing, we're losing democracy for unanimity. And I think that uh, even, you know, considering the expansion of policy areas where qualified majority actually rules, uh, it is a fact that for the Council, unanimity is seeked for, in my view, too many questions. And I think that as a result, people, if they're not happy with the decisions which are being made by the European Union, they don't have an alternative, uh, or they don't see that they have an alternative apart from populism. And in many ways, what we see again in Greece, what we see again in Italy, uh, with the Grillo movement, with Syriza, with, uh, God forbid, Golden Down, uh, you know, those things are unfortunately the reaction of people who have the impression that within the government parties of Europe, um, there is no alternative. We are back to, you know, with Sotkin, we were talking about Belgium earlier. I mean, in a way, we are back to the bad days of Belgian politics, in a way, when people thought that everybody was governing together anyway. So the only way you would actually be able to actually seek some sort of change was by voting for the Flams block of Lance Belang. I mean, it's, it's, 
the place where we are in Europe at the moment, there is no accountability. Um, I don't want to finish on such a negative note though. Uh, and therefore I will just uh, say that I have hope. I live in a city where half of the population is not British. Uh, I live in a city where the foreign people can be rich, can be poor, equally like the British people. Uh, and I think that in a way there is increasingly the emergence of a generation which is changing in its way of life in a way which my generation, which would like to think of itself as reasonably young, uh, doesn't really understand. And I think that from that point of view, uh, there are a number of things. And, and in that sense, you know, I, I completely take Sophie's point about the sort of uh, hope for a sort of more global uh, or cosmopolitan uh, perception, but I think that at the same time, within the European Union, that young generation has experienced it, experienced that notion of cross-border exchange and transmission in many ways um, within Europe. And from that point of view, I still think that uh, there is a hope for European democracy. The problem at the moment is that the heads of states and government don't want it. If we want Europe to become more democratic, we know exactly how to do it. We know what citizens want. They want to be able to vote directly for a president of the European Union. Uh, they want to be able to decide what policy is going to be made in Europe. They want, you know, several proposals about how to get out of the crisis in Europe to be given as options uh, within the European Union as well. Um, they want to have referenda, they want to have popular initiative. There are a number of things which you know, would be very easy to do, but the heads of states and government don't want it because they want to keep control of what is happening. My hope for democracy is the hope that citizens will rebel if the European Union doesn't become more democratic and the heads of states and government progressively will have to face a choice. Either we give them a little bit of what we don't want to give them uh, or we take the risk of them taking away from us something which we know we need in order to be able to make efficient policy, which is the European Union. I think that's, uh, that's the situation we are in right now. Yes, final word. The problem here is that you all raise extremely relevant questions which are worth discussing uh, very much in depth, which we cannot do here, so I will not even try to respond with questions like what is democracy? Let me just uh, be very selective. Migration from the East was raised by you. I don't think that it was covered by any of you, but I can also not add very much to this because I'm not an expert. It is a very complex picture. You find, for instance, extremely high degrees of uh, migration and mobility from Poland and almost zero from the Czech Republic. Why? I wouldn't uh, be able to, uh, to tell you. Um, we are we are losing democracy for technocracy. I think it's an excellent uh, observation. Um, the point here is that this is also a very strange kind of, te uh, of technocracy because from technocracy we would at least uh, expect that they resolve our problems, but they are currently, they're not even able to do this. So um, maybe the question here is uh, through this, uh, a very strange kind of technocratic mismanagement we are, uh, uh, we are observing uh, right now, maybe you learn at least what our problems and what our shared concerns uh, are. And this gives at least uh, some hope as a final uh, word. And uh, on the other hand, I see that you are all uh, uh, now that our main problem is that we are longing for a beer now. So I propose <laughs> we go for this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Many thanks to our guests. Many thanks to the audience.